when people call me a uh, diversity expert, I'll be honest with you, I don't know if I'm a diversity expert. Why do I say that? In large parts because uh, I don't know what a diversity expert is supposed to be like. There's no university on the face of the earth where you get a PhD in diversity. There's no list of criteria that, uh, that says, um, if you do these things and you know these other things, you're now a diversity expert, nothing like that. If I'm an expert in anything, it's around human behavior. And I more consider myself a student of human behavior. My PhD is in the field of communication science. If you know anything about the field of communication science, you know it grows out of two more well-known prominent fields called psychology and sociology. So you can think of me as a, uh, as a, as a psychosociologist, right? Uh, and what I do as a psychosociologist is I study, I study you all. I look at what you're like in your natural habitat, right? I look at what happens to you when you encounter new and novel things. I look at how you treat other people when you don't get enough sleep or under a lot of stress. I'm also this thing called a cognitive neuroscientist. You know what that means? It means I had no dates in college. That's what it means, right? No. no, it just means I'm a geek who studies the brain. My particular branch of neuroscience has been labeled social neuroscience. So I look at how the brain responds in social settings when other human beings are around. I look at how others' behaviors, their words, their actions uh, impact and actually shape our brain over time, and then how our brain influences us to act when we're around other people. The coolest thing I find in social neuroscience uh, is what we'll explore in, in part uh, during my talk today. Uh, that cool thing is this. The human brain, our brain, is optimized to perform at its best under two root conditions. And these two root conditions I'm about to give you are what we call necessary, but not necessarily sufficient conditions. So there needs to be some other factors, but these are among the, the foundational factors, these two factors for sustained optimal performance by the human brain. The two factors, the two conditions are these. Our brain wants to be around other people, condition one, who care about it, condition two. The brain wants to be around other people who care about it. Let's take a quick look at that and we'll explore it a little further in my talk. Let's take that first condition, that first factor. Why does our brain want to be around other people, or as I like to say, be part of a tribe? Why is that so important to the human brain to be around other people and part of a tribe? What do you think? Survival, exactly. Take a look at, this from, uh, look at it from this perspective. Take us, the human being, compare us to the rest of the animal kingdom. For our size and weight, we are relatively weak and slow. A chimpanzee, half our size, is three times as strong as us. That's not even the strongest of the primates. The gorilla, 15 times stronger than us. And Kong, a million times stronger than us, right? You, you take an ant, you drop it from this height, what will it do? Walk away. You take a human being and drop some of the equivalent of this height. Well, we do. <laughs> we will not walk away, right? A fawn is born in the wild. How soon before it begins to walk and run? Yes, within minutes it will be walking. With, uh, walking within the hour, most of them will be running. How soon before a human baby walks? Parents? Yeah, on average about a year. So you kind of get the idea, we need others to survive. Not only do we need them in the womb, our mom, we need them as soon as we're plopped out of the womb. And not just for a few more minutes, days, weeks, months. We need them for another 25 more years, I'm finding out. I have four kids between the ages of 16 and 23. So we need others. We want to be around other people. Uh, but have you noticed you can be around other people and also feel very lonely? See, being alone and loneliness are at times two distinctly different things. So not only do you want to be around other people, we want those people to uh, get this, to value us, to care about us, to hold us in significance. Why is that so important to the human brain to be valued and cared about? What, what do you think? Safety reasons again, survival reasons. Uh, put yourself back in hostile environments long ago. You're, let's say you're part of a tribe. The tribe values you, but they don't value you that much. Let's say they, tr they value other people in the tribe much more than you. Under those conditions, what happens to you when the tribe starts to run low on food and water? You're one of the first not to get food and water, right? What happens to you when the tribe starts to dabble in um, sacrifice? You're one of the first to be experimented on, right? So if you're part of a tribe that value you a great deal, that raise the probability of survival. Take those two factors, add a, a few more factors onto that, uh, sprinkle in a bunch of time, and what you get is this. The brain is hardwired to belong. 
The brain is hardwired to belong. I'll show you the hardwiring a little later. But for no other reasons, that, that's why you should be addressing issues of inclusion. Okay? And with that said, um, I value both diversity and inclusion. I value, value both of them, but I am an inclusion guy first. Because what the research says is, if you don't build an inclusive workplace, diversity only makes it worse. <laughs> When you don't build an inclusive workplace where, where people get along, collaborate, trust one another, communicate well with one another, diversity, bringing different people and ideas in only makes it worse. The research says if you have a, a bunch of different people who collaborate well, who trust each other, who, uh, who communicate well with one another, um, they outperform homogeneous groups. But a diverse group that doesn't trust one another, doesn't collaborate, doesn't communicate well, underperforms homogeneous groups. You can do diversity for optics, but that's really all it is if you don't have inclusion, right? I'm an inclusion guy first. And, and maybe this is the, maybe this, uh, uh, let, let me be my definition of, of inclusion, and, and it'll make more sense when I include another, a few other terms later, but I'll, I'll give you a peek at what my definition of inclusion, why certain terms are very important. Um, see, inclusion is the condition where you minimize outsiders and maximize insiders. Inclusion is the condition where you minimize outsiders and maximize insiders. Remember the terms insider and outsider, we'll get to them uh, fairly soon. Now, uh, you seem kind of quiet. You seem kind of quiet. Uh, I don't know why, maybe it's the afternoon, maybe it's because you're leaders. I get a lot of quiet uh, from leaders in big groups. So uh, I, need to, I need to get you going a little bit. I need to wake up your brain so you can uh, interact more with me. Um, your brain actually has to be warmed up to process complex information. And as you might imagine, when I talk about neuroscience and the brains can be some complex information. So I need to wake your brains up. I used to be a college professor. I'd have these 8 o'clock morning classes where students roll in kind of sleepy or kind of drunk, right? And often a combination of both. So I had to wake their brains up. Uh, easy for me as a neuroscientist, I know how the brain works, so I just, what I do is I just give them a simple math problem. Doing a simple math problem in your head will wake your, up your brain, will get your synapses firing, your neurons going online. So we're gonna do a simple math problem. Uh, for those of you who are mathophobic, do not worry, it's very easy. It's simple addition. I'm gonna give you a series of numbers to add up. Add them up silently in your head, and then when I call out for the answer, yell it out really loudly for all the people around you to hear how smart you are. Because if there's ever going to be a time you're going to get a math problem right, this is the time. It's that easy. Okay? So again, simple addition, no, no, uh, uh, a bunch of rounded numbers, no decimals, no fractions, very easy stuff. Again, do it silently in your head, not on a piece of paper. So put your pens down. And then when I call out for the answer, yell it out really loudly. Are you all set? Begin with the number 1,000. Put 1,000 into your head. To that 1,000, add 40. Add another 1,000. Add 30. Add another 1,000. Add 20. Add another 1,000. Add 10. What's the answer? 5,000. All right, that tells me your brain is working. Give yourselves a hand. Give yourselves a hand. Come on, come on. Very easy, very easy, very good. Now, that tells me your brain is working. Let's just see if your brain is working correctly. Before I had you add 10, you arrived at 4,090. Is that not right? What is 4,090 plus 10? 0 plus 0, 9 plus 1 is 10. Here, the 1 is 4,100. You all suck at math. How'd you get this wrong? Is this a particularly hard math problem? I hope you don't think so, but how'd you get this wrong? And once you figure out how you got it wrong, we're gonna see one of the underlying cognitive reasons why we may make mistakes uh, on a regular basis, <laughs> right? Uh, Groupthink, in, in part, it, it, it's even before that, Terry, it's, it's even before, groupthink plays a secondary role in this. Right? Uh, don't be embarrassed if you got it wrong. I can do this with MIT mathematicians and NASA engineers. 80% of them get it wrong. Why? It's because it's, it's not a measure of intelligence. It's not a measure of math intelligence. But it does give us some understanding of how you got this problem wrong. It gives us some understanding of how your brain operates. Patterns. Your brain loves patterns. 
Your brain loves patterns so much, it will find a pattern where a pattern does not exist. Um, what color is the screen? Everyone say, say the color out loud. Everybody out loud, everybody uh, interact, okay? What color is the screen? 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 What do cows drink? They do not drink milk, they drink water. Your brain will trade accuracy for speed. Your brain trades quality of decision making for quickness of decision making. Your brain loves patterns. That's the reason you got it wrong, but the real underlying reason why you got that problem wrong is that your brain is lazy.